Good evening, my name is Matthew Ogden, and I would like to welcome all of you watching to our weekly webcast on LaRouchePack.com uh, featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. I'm joined in the studio today by Benjamin Denniston from our basement science research team, and uh, we're going to begin tonight's proceedings with a question from an institutional source. Uh, the question reads as follows. Mr. LaRouche, this is a two-part question concerning last week's prisoner exchange between the United States and the Taliban, in which Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was released in exchange for five Taliban commanders who were held at Guantanamo Bay. First, it has come to light that both the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees were unanimously opposed to this prisoner swap back in 2011 when the idea was first presented to them by the Obama administration. President Obama decided not to go to Congress in compliance with the law that he himself signed mandating 30 days advanced notification to Congress of any actions concerning prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. Does this constitute an impeachable crime? How do you assess President Obama's actions in the Bergdahl case, and how do you expect Congress to respond? And second, President Obama pledged during his first presidential campaign in 2008 to shut down the Guantanamo Bay facility. It is still operating six years later. What is your policy for dealing with this situation, both in the immediate case of the Guantanamo Bay facility and what to do about it and the larger issue of President Obama's approach to the global war on terrorism? How would you deal with the continuing problem of global terrorism, given the wide criticism of the Bush-Cheney policy of renditions and torture, and the Obama policy of kill lists and drone warfare? This is, this subject brings us to the question of the urgency of the immediate impeachment of the President of the United States. Now, among all the things that are otherwise being described here on this, on this question, the essential thing is known now. It's known internationally. Obama has been conducting war since the er my greatest part of his presidency. This warfare was already started under his predecessor, not the jerk, jerky Bush, but on, under, uh, you know, Cheney as such. All right, now what's happened is all the things that have been going on in, say, in uh, Northern Africa, uh, in games with the Saudis, with games with terrorists, or the Blair's operation in setting up the Iraq war, which was an unlawful war, a violation of everything by the British monarchy, the British Empire. So what the war has been going on, but it's not called a war. Well, for example, let's take the case of what happened in, uh, it just, just now, recently, in terms of the Ukraine policy. The Ukraine policy is actually under the control of people with Nazi backgrounds. Now, some of them are directly Nazis, but as members of an organization which is founded by the Hit Adolf Hitler himself, and this is the rough and tumble group inside the, that, that part of the nation. Now, the guy who's uh, the angel who pulled this swindle this fraudulent election in Ukraine was a chief financer of the Nazis. Now put this together. You have a fact that's actually since the Bush, Bush Jr. generation, which means really largely, you know, thuggy, but also and totally under the Obama administration, as a whole sweep of the Obama administration, has been conducting Warfare, actual warfare, warfare that violates the Constitution huh? and crimes against humanity. What the point is this, what they've been using is what they call guerrilla warfare. 
and under the name of gangsters and guerrilla warfare types of operations, they've moved in on various countries. For example, all of the Saudi operations of international terrorism were done under the British direction. For example, 9-11 was a British empire, the Queen's own empire, uh, the, that of uh, 9-11. Hmm? The backup on cover for, for the Bush administration, the Bush-Cheney administration, was the same thing. They organized and supported and concealed the fact that there was a warfare operation being run by the British empress under her su surveillance all the way through. Now, the Tony Blair's operation for the Queen in organizing an Iraq war, that was illegal. It was a, it was a, it was a fraud against the nations. What's happening now is that Obama is the patsy. It's actually the Queen who runs this thing. But Obama's been the patsy who's been running in the name of the United States support for operations which are actually warfare. In other words, what Obama has been doing in his meddling in Europe with military operation is a violation of the Constitution, per se. They're conducting war. What, he's, what he did in Iraq, what was done in Iraq, the same kind of thing. The precedent, Northern Africa, the same precedent. It was actually warfare directed by the United States in violation of the Constitution. Now the time has come at which Obama's crimes have become so prominent and we have become so complicated in other parts of the world. Now, how do we have to estimate this thing? Now, you have to understand what o o Putin is doing from this standpoint. Putin is first, first aware that what he's up against is a war against Russia, in particular, which is directed by the President of the United States. It's a fact, he does it. But they don't call it a war. No? It's a scramble. But they're running it as a form of irregular warfare. But it is warfare, it is not irregular. Yes, it's irregular in some respects, but they don't call it warfare, but it is warfare. The idea is that if they go in with annoying things, like these kinds of operations, because they say, well, that's not warfare. These guys are patriots. They're, you know, dealing against repression. When you look at the whole planet, look at the Islamic aspect of this thing. Since the first Chechen uh, war, huh? back then, the whole thing has been continuous since that time. And the British Empire is running it. Now Obama comes out and actually makes a, a statement which is a violation of the Constitution on this grounds, on other grounds. Now the question is, is when, when are there enough patriots in the United States in power in government who will actually say this is illegal warfare under international law and is also illegal under the federal Constitution? The President of the United States cannot conduct war without the approval of the, con of the, con of the uh, Congress. Cannot be done. But it's being done all the time, especially by the Obama case is the most flagrant case. But Cheney was doing the same thing. Cheney was the guy who organized the cover-up of 9-11. Obama just picked up, pick up the ticket for, uh, you know, a renewed ticket. I punched it again. So the point is, the issue is, is the United States fit to exist? Does it have the guts in itself to defend itself against a tyrant, a real satanic tyrant, and to say that the, the British Empire, the British Empress, is a satanic figure is not an exaggeration. If you know, the, if you know history and you go back to the days of the Zeus versus Prometheus issue, and un, un, trace that history, which comes from a Greek drama and account, but if this, was the, this was what the Roman Empire was. This was what the mass execution of Christians was by the Roman Empire. Huh? This is the British Empire. The British Empire was a, modeled on the Roman Empire. And this was, this was a stated policy of the British Empire at that time, in the autumn of that year. 
So we're dealing with, a, we're dealing with an imperial force of a quality which has always been uh, called satanic. In other words, Zeus is a Greek name for Satan. The Roman Empire was a satanic institution. The mass killing of Christians certainly defines it as a, as a, a very evil force, a satanic force. The British Empire is also a satanic force. And this is the reality. The green policy in the United States is a satanic program, program created by the British Empress herself. And the, it's on the record of the British Empress that this is her policy. The details, the green policy, is a mass murderous scheme against the people of the United States. The attempt to cut down carbon in term, now is a mass murderous project. Who's doing it? Obama. Who's he doing it for? Well, the Queen wrote the recipe and gave the orders. And the fact that he's got a bunch of witches around him who are also satanic. Obama. So the issue here has to be treated accordingly. The question is, what do, does the United States have the moral fitness to survive? Now the test is, if it has the moral fitness to survive, it is going to do one, immediately dump Obama. Dump him and impeach him. He's fully impeachable. He's more than impeachable. Well, let's finally impeach the jerk. Get him out of there. And we'll find that his vice president will leave with him for various reasons. Huh? So it means we will have a new vice president as well as a, pre a new president. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a fine idea. The sooner the better. Even a stumble bum would be better than one of these creature, creatures. We had a stumble bum before who was present for, you know, famous. Yeah. So in any case, so this is the issue. This is the essential issue. And all of these questions come under that. It, all the, every policy, in terms of policy, of the Bush-Cheney administration in its two terms, every policy of the Obama administration in its two and a, one and a half or more terms, hmm, has been a satanic force inside the United States. And look at what's happened. Look at the score here. We have two generations of skunk presidents. Or we call them satanic figures. Bush Cheney, and young Bush was, was not, does not knowledge about Satan because his father was Satan. <laughs> so he didn't have to have an explanation. But Cheney, Cheney was a satanic force and still is. Uh, o Obama is totally a satanic force. It has been from the beginning. You go back to the first thing I attacked him on in the fir his first year of li in office, huh? the health care business. Mass murder of our citizens by accelerating their death rates. I proved it then. This man has never been anything but satanic. His policies are satanic. So therefore the question is, what kind of morality does the Congress have? Because it's chiefly the Senate which can most efficiently effect an impeachment of this guy, and it can be done summarily because the evidence is all there. Now, if we get rid of him, and the vice president would probably go too, for, for obvious reasons if you think about it, so what? We can, f we can create a new presidency through the initiative of the, pres of the Senate and the consent of the House of Representatives. We can do much better, and I have a four-point program which will solve many of the problems which have to be dealt with anyway. We can't wait until the next term of office. We have to have certain things now because we're in a bail-in creation. You know what bail-in is? Bail-in is a time when the banks don't give you interest. They take interest away from you. And now if they, and they do it on the basis of their method of speculation. So they speculate you down. They drain the United States of every resource. They eliminate the U.S. population by bail-in. 
and bail-in is already in process. It's not full blast yet, but it's going to the edge of full blast. And if we don't get Obama out of office soon, most of you citizens out there are going to be dead probably this year. Now, there are two ways they can get dead. One is economics, where you no longer, the people no longer have any security at all. They begin to die en masse because every be thing that was necessary to maintain even simple life is now being challenged, and being taken away. And if you take and destroy the entire banking system of the United States by a reverse interest rate, a negative interest rate, and do it at very high and accelerated rates, you can, within a year, destroy the existence of the people of the United States. And this is what the issue is. Don't take the surface issue, don't, don't listen to the headlines on the newspapers, because what they do is they spin everything. We say, we can spin it this way. You say it this way. You spin it that way. But we can spin it this way. Yeah? The spin dizzies. Huh? <laughs> and therefore, we, are we human beings or are we slaves? Are we going to tolerate the destruction of our nation and the threatened destruction of the nation? The, the problem here is what Obama is doing, which is really doing for the British monarchy, what Obama is doing is heading the world toward a thermonuclear war. Why? Because the United States does not have the ability to do anything eff effectively on this planet when you consider the power represented by China, the added power now added to the roster by India, the power represented by Russia and other nations, these nations could, can sustain a war, a continuing war, against a U.S.-British attack. But they don't intend to do that. They're already doing that. The United States is conducting warfare in Europe without declaring war, because they call it something else. And is this, everybody really in Europe, in, in, in positions of responsibility, knows this. But they haven't got the guts to say so. Now, what the British app is, and they made a pit decision publicly on that question, but most people didn't know how to translate it. The British policy has always been, especially since the Copenhagen crisis period, has always been to reduce the population of the planet from seven billion people, which it had been recently, to less than one. In other words, genocide is the policy of the British Empire. Genocide is the policy of Obama. Genocide was the policy of uh, you know, the previous term. Dem yeah. So this being the fact, why can't we accept facts rather than interpretation, rather than spin? Leave the spin to the spiders. <laughs> Don't bring them in for politicians. A spider is never a good politician. Uh, anyway, so this, th the whole thing has to be stated truthfully. You do not have to be nice. You do not have to spin it. You do not have to accept the spin when you know it's a lie. If you know it's a lie, it is a lie. And you can't say it's uh, their spin or my spin, or somebody else's spin. And that's what this is all about. This is the reality. And that's what we have, that's what we have to proclaim from the rooftops. Well, let me follow up directly on what you said about this state of warfare. Um, President <laughs> Vladimir Putin did, delivered an interview to French television this week right before going to uh, France in the celebration of the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And uh, after beginning the interview by paying tribute to the alliance of countries who freed Europe from Nazism, including mentioning the fighters in the French resistance, um, Putin immediately pointed his finger at, quote, those in Europe and the United States who are now supporting an anti-constitutional armed coup in Ukraine, and then 
what he said, which unleashed chaos and violence right on Russia's border. And this is a point that he returned to repeatedly throughout the interview, citing not only Ukraine, but also precisely the same type of operation which is being attempted in Syria. Um, now, he also identified the lies that were told by Cheney and by Tony Blair that started the Iraq war. What's very interesting is that the same time that Putin delivered this interview, uh, a major security conference had just occurred in Moscow with all of the top general staff of the Russian armed forces on exactly this same subject. Uh, they identified the so-called colored revolutions. It's a bad euphemism. <laughs> as a, they identified these as a new type of warfare in which there are no front lines and in which the commonly accepted rules of warfare are ignored. And um, the head of, of operations for the Russian general staff spoke and said the following. He said, colored revolutions are a new technique of aggression geared towards destroying a state from within by dividing its population. The key question for military planners is which state will be targeted next. The main factor in determining targets is the geopolitical interests of the provoking state. For this reason, such revolutions are organized primarily in countries that have an important strategic position and conduct an independent foreign policy. The destabilization of such countries allows for a major shift in the balance of power in that particular region. Now, in the same interview, Putin counterposed these warfare operations that are being run to intimidate nations into giving up their sovereignty to what he called supranational bodies, both militarily and economically. He counterposed this to what Russia is doing to develop its own territory and to integrate with other nations in Asia, both through the new Eurasian Economic Union and this new emerging Eurasian triad, as you've identified it, Russia, China, India. And Putin asserted that the model that he envisions for Europe is not this European Union thing, but what Charles de Gaulle had in mind. He said, I think of the Gaullist tradition and General Charles de Gaulle, who protected France's sovereignty. I think this deserves respect. Now, De Gaulle's idea of Europe was a community of sovereign nations from the Atlantic to the Urals, which includes obviously the nation of Russia. And as in the case of the recent elections in France, you now see a resurgence of this Gaullist idea in Western Europe, which I'm sure Putin is very aware of. So you've identified that just as you have a triad forming in Eurasia, there's also now a similar triad emerging in Western Europe to, between Germany, France and Italy. My question is, how can these two triads come together to defeat the British Empire? And what's it going to take to get the United States to play its proper role in this new strategic configuration? Well, what the United States has to do is dump Obama, because Obama is nothing but a British stooge, just as the Bush-Cheney administration was a British stooge. And what Bush-Cheney did in terms of the Iraq war was a fraud. It was a fraudulent war. It was a crime by the United States, a crime by the United States in supporting the British in that crime. And many leading figures, patriots of Britain, the, of the United Kingdom, died to cover up the fact of what Tony Blair did and what was also coming from the United States at the same time. The 9-11 thing. The British Empire organized 9-11. And they used the Saudi instruments, who are nothing but tools of the British Empire, to do that. So you have Bush Cheney covers up 9-11, a fraud against the people of the United States, covering up a mur mass murder against the citizens of the United States, including the Pentagon offices. It's a crime against the United States. They should have been put in prison for this. Even now they belong in prison. 
Bush doesn't mean anything, we can put him in a lower cell someplace. But Cheney is still around, and Cheney is pure evil. Obama is pure evil. He's only a stooge for the British Empire. So the point we have to understand that this is there is such a thing, not politics, not political stymies, not this. There is such a thing in history as truth. The truth of mankind is based on the nature of mankind, the true nature of mankind, well, which is that mankind is a species which is unique to among all other living species, which we've written a good deal about in recent years in our organization. We've gone through much of the history. We know the history of this process. We are, I'm an expert in this area. Some of our other members are, are be experts or becoming experts in this area to know what the principle of, of the universe is, how it works, how it functions, what humanity's role is. Humanity is the child of the universe. Is that is the a chosen child of the universe is mankind, and the interest of mankind, which means all the biblical members prosper, grow become richer, become better. Huh? Each generation must become better than the next one. The policy is to ensure that your children and grandchildren are superior in their achievement than you are, because you are supposed to make them better than you are by their, their progress, their contribution to progress, give you a, a launching pad as a child of these people to become a leaders of another higher generation. That's the lawful principle of humanity. And when it comes up with a green policy, a green policy is literally a satanic policy. It's literally satanic. The, the green policy in the United States is a satanic cult and should be removed from existence. Then what they're doing with the coal issue, the so-called carbon issue, is a criminal fraud against humanity, a calculated stroke of mass murder against human beings inside and outside the United States. These are the truths. We're looking for people with the insight and, more important, the guts to throw these guys out of power and trash their foolish, fraudulent concoctions. <coughs> okay, Lynn, in this exact direction, actually, you just laid out. Um, I have a question on the role of Vladimir Vernotsky in the prospects for a trans-Pacific alliance among nations. And as we've discussed on these Friday shows and as we're seeing, there's obviously a major, major shifts going on in the global situation. There's a shift in political economic weight away from this dying transatlantic system, away from this Anglo-Dutch imperial system over towards Asia, as you discussed, towards Russia, China, India. There's a shift in the type of activity these nations are doing, away from this zero growth paradigm that you just discussed on the green ideology, and towards a pro-growth, pro-development orientation. And it's every single week you have new breaking stories on major rail projects here, major nuclear power projects there, major agreements towards space cooperation this week, next week, coming out of this Asian orientation. So you have a shift in the type of activity going on. But I would, would like you to elaborate more specifically on your idea of the thoughts of the needed shift in this view of mankind, which we, you just elaborated. Obviously, this Anglo-Dutch imperial view is completely centered on the idea of mankind as a beast, a totally oligarchical idea that, you know, Prince Philip, the uh, consort to this Queen of England, has said explicitly population growth is a plague on the planet. He's explicitly declared the idea that uh, he would wish to be reincarnated as a deadly virus. That'd be like his greatest dream would be to come back as a deadly virus to counteract what he views as the scourge of human population growth.
But this is the concept of mankind of this Anglo-Dutch imperial view of the green policy overall. But very specifically, you've been referencing recently the work of Vernotsky explicitly. And Vernotsky's view of mankind's role on the planet Earth, but also in the solar system and beyond. And I'm curious if you think that Vernotsky's notion of the nature, nature of mankind can be sufficient to be the central thesis around which sovereign nations and can, can collaborate in a new era of development. Well, if you want to use the idea of the uh, a chapter which envelops the subject matter you want to cover, Vernadsky is probably the best model to consider because he was the first one that actually defined adequately what was accomplished by Bernard Riemann, what was accomplished by Max Planck, which was accomplished by you know, our great uh, Einstein. You know? uh, and he was the best of them. Because what he did, not that, he, no, not that, that to denigrate or reduce the importance of these people's work, because they, they are actually predecessors of a great trio from the Renaissance level, a Brunelleschi, huh? of Kepler, as well, and also Nicholas Acuza. They created civilization out of a dust bowl of evil. Huh? They did it. They did it on, in defense of the mort immortality, actually, of Jean Jacques. They were stirred up by that and recognized that they had to take up stand as the church, to take a stand against evil in the form of then the British Empire at that time. Huh? And then, as a result of this, then you had Kepler's discovery of the solar system. And Kepler discovered the solar system. There is no competent astronomy by anyone today who does not acknowledge Kepler as the uh, discoverer of the solar system. Nobody else ever did it. All these other guys were fakers. The Dutch were fakers. Huh? The Spanish were fakers. The British were fakers. The English were fakers. Huh? And the Roman and the uh, British were also great fakers. And they were on the all on the satanic side. Well, what's the issue of satanic then? That the human species is absolutely unique. There is no animal which fits the description of mankind. None. We, we cook people, we, cook, we don't cook people, but we cook animals. Is that immoral? No, it is not immoral. It's only immoral if it's a waste. You must not waste animal life. You must make it fruitful at the service of the species for which the, is resp the responsible species, mankind. Mankind must deal with the animal kingdom in a just manner, but recognizing that it's not human, it's an animal. You know, vegetables, of course, don't even get a, a, a word in edgewise on this one. Mm. All right, so the point is what, what is, what is mankind then? How can we define mankind as different than some mere animal, like you know, our present president today? Obama is nothing but an animal, but morally, he's an animal. I don't know how he got children. It must have been an accident. But then points, so therefore, what, what's the thing? Mankind, what's mankind? What is different about mankind, which implies a lawful principle, an international lawful principle? It says simply that mankind has a quality which we call chemistry. Now, chemistry is often misunderstood or misunderstood in, in, in the real sense of understood. But the principle is that in the human species, the first thing that you observe about a human species in terms of the hist history of, of species is that mankind is the only so-called animal which ever cooked its own food. No other creature, no animal ever cooked its own food. Only the human species. Now, the other part of the human species is there, the, there's a quality about the human being, even the poor 
early man who cooked his own food. Well, what's cooking? Well, we call it today chemistry. Now, the, you don't want to cook something in terms of burning it down to a crisp. <laughs> you want to cook it up into something better, something that has more potency to improve mankind's power in, this, in the solar system. Now, what does this mean in chemistry? Well, we, it, 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 in simple terms, for the typical student of the early part of the 20th century, chemistry meant at that time, up to that time, it meant that we were discovering how the, there were elements, we called them. And these elements, when combined in a certain way, gave a, a process of development of living processes. We looked at the animal kingdom, the evolution of the animal kingdom. We saw how animal kingdom form of life functions. They grew too. They developed into higher kinds of species, but they never be able, were able to cook their food. And mankind not only cooks his own food, but he doesn't stop there. Obama's not edible. <laughs> no, because mankind increases the power of mankind with respect to the defense and organize of the civilization on planet Earth and is destined to take over the prob problems of solving the problems within the solar system. The solar system, which was invented by whom? by Kepler. Huh? So therefore, the, the, mankind is a species unlike any other. The human species is a creative species. The human species embodies the idea of creation per se. The meaning of life is not li uh, the idea of living and dying. The meaning of human life is progress of the human species. And the standard is the human species from generation to generation should rise in a, a species characteristic to higher and higher forms. And for example, any day now, any year now, nobody knows, a great big rock is going to hit Earth and everybody is going to be dead. Now, how can that be prevented? If mankind develops the technologies and applies them, to begin to maneuver and control these threatening beasts, these asteroids, otherwise there's no solution. So therefore, the, it's obvious that mankind's mission within the solar system and beyond is implicitly defined by the need to maintain the progress of the solar system itself. For example, as you know, that the, we have processes now in which there we have powers in, this, in units of action which far exceed the solar, the sun, the sun itself. Mankind is actually creating a, mo a mode of action which exceeds the power of the sun itself, which means that the solar system is not merely the son of a bitch or whatever. Uh -uh. And therefore, this conception of mankind, the idea is, not that you're going to live a good life. Nobody lives a good life. They all die. Everybody dies. All human beings die. So you're not going to live a good life for yourself. You're going to live a good life for those who come after you. You become the necessity of their existence. And only mankind does that. That is the human quality. It's the only agency in the solar system which can organize the solar system. Only, only mankind in the solar system could keep the sun from going dead. And then we go up to the, ga the galaxy next, is what's up going up there. And we got some other steps to go up later on. We just haven't touched it much into those areas. We've just uh, intimations of their existence. <laughs> so the po that's the point. Our destiny is not to have a good man, a good woman. That's a very nice idea. But what's the practical implication that it must mean? The history of mankind is mankind is always, when it's good, mankind always tries to make their children better than the parents were in terms of the contribution to the future of mankind. Mankind has a destiny to fulfill we can now foresee it scientifically as a destiny of the solar system. 
But when we look at the whole process, we say that can't be the limit. So mankind has to become a power more powerful than the solar system itself in terms of our powers of our action to help build up the universe into higher forms and to discover what that means. And only mankind can do that. Only, only mankind has a truly divine mission in the universe. And that's our obligation, that's our destiny, that's my policy, and that's my belief, and that's my dedication. Well, you know, everything that you just said um, sparked um, the, uh, the question of what we were discussing last night on what is true strategy, what hardly anybody outside of yourself who is alive today understands this question. And uh, something that you said last night during the discussion that we had, I found really quite provocative because you said the key to actually understanding strategy is to be able to see mankind as a single unit, as a uh, individual planetary unit, which is going through a certain internal change, an internal turmoil, not divided into parts, and understand this as a unity of a process globally as a one. And you stressed that it's only possible to do this if one rises above sense perception and views mankind as, for example, Vernatsky did as a planetary species uh, in a noospheric uh, unity, but also from the outside, from the standpoint of man's necessary role in the solar system or even in the galaxy beyond. And you stressed that, especially now, now that man is unified and that warfare is no longer a feasibility, the essential question is promoting this unity of mankind. Um, I thought it was very provocative that you said all of the, although you do need differences in culture, in language culture, in sovereign nationalities, all of the artificial divisions that are created inside mankind by the British Empire uh, are unacceptable. And that the key is creating this coherence of mission this um, unity of purpose for the whole species. And th that's the job of the true strategist, to define the future, to define the common mission which mankind has to be unified towards from the top down and try to bring this coherence to man as a unity. Now, um, what that really resonated with in my mind today was, as people probably know, today is the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, June 6th, 1944, when the Allied forces finally succeeded in opening a Western Front against the Nazis after years of obstructions and delay by Winston Churchill and by the British. And I went back and I listened to the radio address that President Roosevelt gave on that day to the American people, which he delivered in the form of a prayer. And it's really quite moving. Um, but what it made me think about was the significance of Roosevelt speaking on precisely this question of the necessity for achieving a unity among the world's sovereign nation states for a common purpose, which obviously includes the end of empire. And I just want to read what he said at the very conclusion of this prayer. He said, um, let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dulled. Let not the impacts of temporary events, of temporal matters of but fleeting moment, deter us from our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogancies. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. 
so a few a few weeks ago you made the point that these great anniversaries memorial day d-day should not just be seen as days of remembrance of the past but they should be opportunities to rededicate ourselves to creating the future and so on this occasion i think i'd like to ask the question uh from the standpoint of true strategy how do we continue Roosevelt's vision of a true peace among nations and bring this ever-increasing unity and coherence of common mission to man? Well, there's a good example of this. I think there's no adequate available answer to the whole question. But there are aspects of this which are available and which can be expressed. What's, where's the root of our problem in the United States? Let's forget the other nations for a moment. Let's talk about the education system inside the United States. Let's talk about its history. Now, what, is, what has been done in, in the sense of informing people, including children, what their mission in existence is? Not in life, but in existence, in having been a, an existent person. Because everybody dies. We don't have any record of any surviving person who's been going back to the, say, with the Adam and Eve level, who's still around today. Methuselah was obviously was famous in, the, in certain biblical teachings, huh? but even he died. So there, no everybody dies. So obviously, death is not the object of human existence. It is not the meaning or uh, human existence. It's what the growth of mankind from a simple creature with certain inventive potentials, which no animal species has. And therefore to say that the dedication of mankind is to discover what mankind is. And what mankind is can only be defined as what mankind must become. This must become is not a fixed, finite uh, talent. What means what must become is the development of an increasing power of the talent to achieve things that have never been achieved by mankind before. And that's morality. Morality is devotion. Now, what are we doing in the school systems? Think about it, how evil the school systems are. They were bad in my lifetime, even when I was a child. They were worse in my, I knew they were worse by the time I was into, you know, midterms in education. I was, I was appalled when I returned from war and went to the same university I'd gone to before. Not a very good university, I must say. It was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Junk was taught. But what was taught was the teacher is going to tell you what you should believe. The teacher is putting a lid on what you can allow allowed to believe. And if you some, say something that challenged the teachers, I did you know, a couple of times, especially on the question of you know, Euclidean geometry. I didn't know what it was, but what I, when I refer, the subject first came up and I knew about geometry, I didn't know about Euclidean geometry. And it was junk. And so the, I was one of the two who was in, proposed, you, why, don't you, why don't you say what you think geometry is? So I said, well, that. and I, you know, I said uh, the change from the uh, cast iron structures into the, you know, the structures with the holes in them, which the structure, these structures were more powerful. And therefore, that, therefore, since that is, is, is a more powerful way of building things, including skyscrapers, as in photo iron, iron cast iron buildings uh, with bricks around them, uh, that this was a fraud. And the whole school system was saying, this was crazy. See, he's talking nonsense. This is not geometry. We know what geometry is, Euclidean geometry. We know that. And they would have more Euclidean geometry classes in the, in the secondary school, and they got the same crap in universities. The, the, the whole idea of mathematics instead of science was what I was being taught in universities. You would find a few people who were in obscure places, relatively speaking, who were the, you know, had the, were patrons of people who were, were great scientists. They had a few of them left. 
But that's all we have left. The great mass of the U.S. population is incredibly stupid. Why? Well, for one big reason, they're stupid and more stupid all the time because the teachers are more stupid. So therefore, the children are more stupid in each generation because the teachers, are, in most cases, are stupid. The class instruction, the, the, all the manuals of the teacher education system are based on this stuff. We teach you what you have to believe. You are graded, if you don't stick to that, we're going to give you a bad grade. And this is, this is what goes on. So therefore, you see what the point is. is this was a British influence. It's not an American influence. You take the, the base, Massachusetts Bay Colony. It was never like that. The, be, the best of the American Revolution was never like that. It was always the idea of progress, going to a higher, more authoritative, more effective, more true solution. A solution which is superior by applying these principles than anything before. So it was the idea of progress per se as an expression of being the meaning of human life per se, of always doing something which brings mankind more successfully to whatever this mystical intention is and we can, you can use chemistry, which is almost illegal these days. You can't use chemistry as, in a real sense. You can use it as names of things. Huh? But, so that's the problem. And what we need to do is, is ha have a new, a fresh approach res with respect to what's been going on to reverse that. Now, let's take the c one case just for comparison. What about the, West, the transatlantic region? What is the educational policy of the transatlantic region? Degenerative. Always more degenerative. You have a few isolated cases of competent scientists and, and other intellectual figures. But the population in general is be stupid and becoming more stupid all the time. If why? Well, the education system is a symptom of the reason. It's not the cause of the system. It's the cause, the cause of the system of government. You know, there has been no progress in technology or productivity in the U.S. Co economy since the beginning of the 1970s. Not one inch. The net progress is zilch. We have been going backwards per capita. The conditions of life, look at this thing we got in California. Yeah? All right, you, you had people were living in these rather shacks. Uh, in, in, in the, that part, up, up there in San Francisco, right? shack areas. What happened is the, the real estate speaker kicked the, kicked the people who've been living in these poor places, poor living places, kicked them out of their homes, then put a high price on what they, what they had bought over, uh, uh, and they're still shacks. So isn't that an example uh, for what San Francisco morality is? that the city, the organization would take people who were living in shacks, which are barely tolerable by our standard then, then saying, these are mansions now, the new mansions. And the fools who think they're now the new rich are living in hovels, uh, which are going no place. This is San Francisco. This is the politics of San Francisco. It's very difficult to educate a San Franciscan. You have to find people like they come, they're Chinese, Chinese, or they're Mexican, or something like that. They t will tend to be intelligent, but the typical t the San Francisco type, ever since the <laughs> change from when, when people f forgot what sex was or something, they just abandoned their sex identities, <laughs> and then they hoped for whatever else would come from it, and they would go for things which had no longer were, even had a sex. They worshipped drugs. They married drugs. They became so much drug rated that they were practically drugs themselves. You wouldn't want to come touch them. You wouldn't want to be near them. Their breath was probably full of all kinds of drugs you have not yet discovered, but a crossbreeding of these, these, this crap. So what's happened is what, the time has come, together with the appropriate moment of throwing Obama out of the presidency now, and throwing this whole program out of the presidency now, I have laid out a four-point program 
which is based entirely upon the intention of the U.S. federal constitution. Some of these things are explicitly that. The principles laid down, for example, by uh, my great friend, you know, uh, was, is exactly that. You know, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton laid down the law of the economy of the United States as the principle of the Constitution. It was the principle of the Constitution. But what happened is many people, uh, even presidents, and there were more often presidents who were bums than were good ones. Um, and they said, no, we're going to swap our goods for prices, monetary gains in foreign trade, state by state. So the state by state system of economy destroyed the sovereignty of the United States. Until we had, you know, a couple, th two presidents who changed that Monroe and John Quincy Adams. Then you had skunks who were British skunks. The, the, the skunk house was smelling all over the place. Jackson. Jackson was an ignorant, boorish creep. And Van Buren was the wise guy from Manhattan who represented European foreign interests, chiefly British, and swiped and ruined what was left of the United States at that period. There was no progress in the United States of any net gain from the time that Jackson came to power until Abraham Lincoln became president. Then you had a whole period of farces after that. And you had a few presidents here and there who were genius and who did great things, like Franklin Roosevelt. But what have we had since, you know, my friend Bill Clinton? He made good efforts. He wasn't a bad guy at all. He, was, had, his, he had his problems and tried to, how to learn how to cope with his vice president, for example, and to cope with some other things. And he's now, you know, under pressure now. But in general, Reagan was a, was a decent guy and quite competent if he didn't have all this crap, crap around him. He had good intentions. But in general, we have, we've had crap as our presidents. And we had the worst with the last two sets of presidencies, the worst things ever, ever dumped on the United States. So therefore, the question is virtue, what is truth, what is mission? It's the question of how do we understand that mankind's de destiny is not to be as good as their parents were, but to be better. Now, that doesn't happen with every family, but if you have a net effect for among the families of a population, then mankind is going to progress. And we know that the principle is, a, a, is progress in that sense. You, ne you never know what it is as a fact, of an object, but you know that it's better in terms of the mission than before. And therefore, the purpose of mankind is to be better. And the, the expression of that now is like Vernansky's insight into the significance of, these, of, the, uh, of mankind in the solar system. The mankind was intended now that we have mankind who is capable of exerting power, a form of power, a quality of form of power, which exceeds that of the sun, we know, therefore, that man's ability and mission is to utilize the, these technologies, these discoveries of principle, which are more powerful than those of the solar system today and will be in the future. That is the human principle. There's a mission embedded somewhere in this universe. We have not located the proper name of that mission. We have a good approximation in terms of what mankind can understand about, about the solar system now and what are intimations of what was beyond, because they're more powerful than the solar system. Like the galaxy is more powerful than the solar system. So shouldn't we try to make, get our position of being managers of the solar system? But that's not enough. To be managers of the polar system, so polar system, you have to do so, you have to do something else. You have to say, well, the, the galaxy is much more powerful. If we look at there, the, the Earth, the whole solar system is being pushed around by this big bully 
called the galaxy. <laughs> and we know that there's a higher order which is kicking the uh, go galaxy around. So therefore, mankind says, well, if that's the case, and mankind's destiny is to always achieve higher and higher goals for mankind for the sake of some purpose embedded characteristically in the system. It might be called the God principle. Hmm? Say God is demanding, demanding us that we grow up. We don't know how long that it's intended to go along. But we have a pretty good idea it might be permanent. Okay. I think... I think that's a concluding point for our discussion tonight. So I would like to thank everybody for watching and thank you very much, Lynn, for the discussion here. And thank you, Ben, for joining me. Please stay tuned and good night.